Hi friends, Cole here from Selkirk United Church with our midweek message for January 27th, 2021. Instead of saying Cole here, I almost said cold here. That would have been true too. I hope you're staying warm during these wintry days. First things first, I want to share with you again the information about the Lenten Reflections book that I was talking about last week and on Sunday. There has been some interest from a number of people in the congregation, so we are definitely going ahead with a bulk order. Most people are ordering the actual book, and a few are ordering the ebook version online. Due to the interest, it, it is my intention to offer a Lenten study of some sort this year. I haven't worked out all the details, but I think it will be a twice a week Zoom gathering to discuss the previous three or four days worth of reflections. The presumption is that people will read their daily reflections from the book on their own, and then if any of you so wish, you can join the Zoom call and we can discuss some of the things that we've all been reading in the book for the past three or four days. At least that's the plan so far. That will, of course, be open to any and all who wish to take part. I should also mention that if you're interested in purchasing the Reflections book, whether or not you'd like to take part in the study, there is a deadline for ordering the book through the church, and that deadline is coming up quickly, two days from now. If you could let us know by Friday, we will then send in our order, and that will hopefully guarantee that we get the books by the start of Lent, which is February 17th this year. The cost of the books is $15.95 each, or the alternative is the ebook version, which is $7.95. So let us know soon, and we'll get the books ordered. You can send your email to chris at selkirkunitedchurch.ca or to me, cole at selkirkunitedchurch.ca. And oh, the name of the book is Faith on the Move, Daily Reflections on Hope and Change. I also wanted to share with you today part of a reflection that was offered by a colleague of mine in an online group that I belong to. I found this to be a very hopeful and very helpful reflection as we continue to struggle in the midst of this pandemic. Lisa Waite compared what we're going through to the disciples of Jesus in the boat in the middle of the storm. You remember that reading. She started off her reflection by saying, it kind of feels like we've all been living through an endless stream of Mondays over the past year, doesn't it? Sort of like Narnia under the spell of the White Witch. You know, always winter, but never Christmas. Later in her reflection, she writes, I am reminded of how many people are suffering significant disruptions to their lives and their livelihoods because of this virus. Physical health, emotional health, mental health, financial stability, school and work routines, sports and social activities, family relationships, spiritual well-being. It's a comprehensive list. The pandemic response has varied from region to region and country to country, but I think we can probably all agree that people are suffering in the midst of it all. And this suffering is something that feels somewhat outside of our control. Yes, we can personally choose to wear a mask or take the vaccine when it's available, but we can't force our neighbors to do the same. Many people seem to view the suffering caused by the pandemic as a burden, one that just has to be toughed out and endured as stoically as possible by hunkering down and trying to stay calm despite our fear. This isn't terrible advice as far as it goes, but I think that the witness of Jesus and the disciples from Matthew 14 offers us a different example to follow. She says, do you remember how Jesus feeds the large crowd, estimated to be at least 5,000 men, plus all the nameless women and children who weren't counted by the gospel writer? He feeds them with only five small loaves and two little fish. The hungry masses are amazed and satisfied. But Jesus doesn't allow the disciples to linger. Instead, he asks them to get back into the boat and to head to the opposite shore. Do you, do you also remember that Jesus didn't join them in the boat, but instead chose to dismiss the crowd and to climb further up the mountain to be by himself and to pray? The disciples are either sailing or rowing faithfully during the entire time that Jesus was climbing the mountain and retreating in prayer. However long it took, Matthew's gospel claims that their boat was being battered by the waves and that they had been driven far away from the land. The wind was against them says verse 25 in the New Revised Standard Version of the text. 
That seems like quite an understatement, she writes, but the image is suitable, isn't it? Doesn't it feel like the last year has been one giant global effort to row against the wind, furiously straining at the oars, frantically using the bailing bucket to scoop and dump water back out of the boat, just as another wave crashes over the side and replaces what you've bailed and more? I know it has often felt that way for me and for my family. In the midst of the furious squall, she writes, it really can seem like our own little boat is in peril, about to be swamped or capsized, and we really can feel like we're about to drown. In those desperate moments, as the wind howls and the waves crash down, when we're shivering and soaked to the bone and our confidence is shaken, when we can't see the shore, the GPS isn't working, and we have no idea where we are, let alone where our original destination is, it is pretty common to not only feel miserable and afraid for our lives, but to also wonder if God truly cares about us, if our lives even matter, if we'll ever hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking into our situation again, or if we'll even survive the situations we find ourselves facing. She then writes about how we do have some choices to make while we wait out this storm. We could do nothing. Just hope and pray that God will intervene on our behalf, that Jesus will walk across the water as he did for the disciples and save the day. That might happen. Let's keep praying for sure, and let's keep turning to God for support and for guidance. But there are probably other things that we could be doing in the meantime. Lisa points out that if you're in a boat in the middle of a storm and the water is pouring over the sides and the boat is filling up and it seems like it's about to sink, if you happen to have a bailing bucket in the boat, you might want to consider using it to bail some of the water. Sounds like a good strategy to me. She then goes on to encourage people to do what they can in whatever circumstances they find themselves in, using what they do have at their disposal. And that will be different for each of us, but God does give each of us and all of us gifts, skills, love, kindness, empathy, intellect, all sorts of talents and abilities that we can put to good use while we wait. That's some great advice. She also encourages us to judge ourselves and our actions with mercy, more in line with the way God sees us. More mercy. I really like that idea. And she assures us that we are not alone. I don't know how many times we need to hear that, but I think it's a lot. We do hear it a lot. I hear myself saying that a lot. We are not alone. But I think it's important. It's a good thing to keep hearing it. We are forgetful. And sometimes we find it hard to believe, especially when life is difficult, when we're facing challenges and change and hardship and loneliness and grief. It's hard to believe that God is really still with us. But God is. Lisa puts it this way. Jesus saw his disciples struggling to go in the direction he had sent them. They spent the whole night rowing or sailing against that wind, and in the early morning, he starts walking toward them on the water. No big deal for the Son of God, but for the disciples it was terrifying. They thought he was a ghost. And those tough, practical fishermen and laborers who had witnessed with their own eyes the miraculous power of God over and over again, they were terrified still. Verse 26 says, they cried out in fear. And Jesus speaks to them immediately. He doesn't leave them hanging. He doesn't delay his response. He isn't holding back to test their faith. He calls out to them immediately, telling the whole group to take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can respond to his own disciples so kindly with such mercy when they fail to recognize him, Perhaps we can use this template as a response to our own fears and struggles. Maybe we can also imagine God telling us in the midst of our contemporary storm to take heart. It's me, and I am with you. Do not be afraid. It is the constant, merciful presence of Jesus that allows my faith to grow. It is the constant, faithful presence of Jesus that gives me the courage and confidence to face the reality of my circumstances day by day. I can see myself less critically and more mercifully. 
when I remember that while it is okay to wish and to pray for the storm to go around me or to be spared the worst of the deluge, the key truth that changes my perspective is that God is with me in the storm, no matter how fiercely it rages around me. Thanks to Lisa Waite for those thoughts. I hope you find them helpful as we all wait out this storm together. Let's not just wait passively, but let's continue to be active in our loving, in our caring, active in our justice seeking, in living out our faith as God would have us live, as Jesus showed us how in so many ways. That's it for today. Take care, friends. Be well and be kind with others and with yourself. And know that God is with you always. See you next time. God bless.